Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, make it 50. And then he asked another, and how much do you owe? And he replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> Please be seated. I have to confess that I have tendencies towards being a curmudgeon. I tend to take a somewhat dim view of humanity. And, and the nice thing about that is that I'm rarely ever disappointed and I am regularly um, pleasantly surprised. And, and I, I've come to this sort of, you know, through, through observation, but also through just sort of an examination of my, my own experiences and, and how I am in the world, that there is something about people that tends to make them just like a little selfish, a little self-concerned, a little self-centered. And, and I exhibit this, I'll give you a good example. Say, for example, it is International Buy a Priest of Beer Day, which, which is a real thing, and it was last week. So last week was International Buy a Priest of Beer Day, and say one of you decided to bring me a six pack of beer. Now, what I would normally think to myself is, sweet, six free beers, right? But if I wasn't such a selfish person, I would think to myself, who are five friends I could share my beers with? <laughs> See, we're just inherently sort of self-concerned. That's just kind of how it works. And, and the thing is, is that all of us are sort of like this. And if we want to give it some churchy language, we can call it something like original sin or something, whatever. But there's just something about us that often puts a barrier between the generosity that God might ask of us and the generosity we really want to feel. And so we have this individually. And so when we come together, we can't help but have our relations with others sort of be impacted by this sort of innate way that we are, right? And so it's, it sort of is accounted for in our relationships, it's accounted for in our society and in our institutions. In fact, it's famously accounted for in our American form of government because if you, you read the, the framers of the constitution, they were very concerned about the ways that sort of people are, they didn't use this language, but sinful. And, and so they tried to create a system where sort of different people's sins would sort of counteract each other and balance out, right? So checks and balances. That's what that's all about. Sort of taking account of the reality of human nature and still trying to build as effective a system as possible. But, but these, these sort of, you know, self-regarding sins are sort of baked into our society in such a way that they, they color and impact everything. Right. 
Um, theologically, we call it uh, systemic sin, right? So it's not necessarily sin that, that you have personally committed, right? But, it, but you kind of get caught up and become sort of complicit in things, sometimes even without your knowledge because of this, this tendency of humans to, to, to bring their sinfulness into their societies, right? Probably the most famous example and the easiest one to explain is racism. Right now, racism is a real problem in America, and it has a long history, and, and it, it's, it's sort of rooted in decisions that were made by people sometimes very long ago, and sometimes really not that long ago, right? But, but racism is a system that seeks to give opportunities to some while denying opportunities to another, right? That that when they built the highway through the city, it went through the parts of the city where all the African-American people lived. They could have built it somewhere else, but that's where they chose to build it, right? And, and they created social security. They specifically left out sectors of the economy, the economy that predominantly employed African-American people, right? So most African-Americans in the 1930s were either farm hands or domestic servants. And those people aren't eligible to participate in social security. After the war, when the veterans came home and they were given loans to buy houses and, and, and grants to go to college, well, African-American folks weren't really given those opportunities. And if they were able to get a mortgage, they weren't necessarily able to buy a house anywhere in one of those nice new neighborhoods because the banks sort of conspired to make sure they could only buy houses in, in the segregated areas that they chose to sequester people like that, right? And, and I will say like our church, this parish, when they were building Highway 81, the leaders of this church really were concerned about the displacement of African-American people in the city. And they, they created a coalition on the west side to try to convince landlords to, to rent to African-American people. And if you probably look around at your neighbors, you will realize that that effort mostly fell on deaf ears, right? And so that's a, that's a system that some of us, we get advantages from, even though we may not personally be filled with any sense of, of malice or prejudice or bigotry. I mean, I don't think anyone here is, is, you know, motivated by racial hatred. And yet we live in a system of disparity. And, and, and even if we want to do something about it, we don't even know where to begin. And that's just an example, right? There's lots of systems like that, the way that, that women have been treated for, you know, most of history, you know, that like in the 1970s, up until the 1970s, a bank could refuse to open a checking account to a woman. Like she can only get it through her husband. That's astounding to me. Astounding. And so, so... The problem with these systems is not just that it, it leaves certain people disadvantaged and that it denies opportunity to some people, but it also hurts those of us who benefit from the system because we could be benefiting so much more. I mean, there's only so many Mozarts that show up in the world and only so many Einsteins and only so many Marie Curies. But if we systematically segregate and deny half the population, women, or a significant part of the world's population, African people, then, then the Marie Curies and the Einsteins and the Mozarts who, who could have flowered amongst them never get the chance. And who knows what, what pieces of art or what science or what breakthroughs we could have known by now if our systems hadn't regularly dismissed even the opportunity for some to participate, right? And so, and so when we get this story today, this gospel story, the manager is sort of caught up in this systemic sin, right? He works for a rich man. And undoubtedly, because of what we know from, the, from history and from Jesus' own teachings, that the rich man probably didn't get that way by good, honest, hard work. And he's probably taking advantage of someone because that's one of the things that Jesus talks about a lot. And so this manager is sort of complicit in this system of oppression that the rich man is enacting on his debtors. Maybe he overcharges, maybe, you know, usury, like excessive interest rates. That's a, that's a sin and a violation of the Mosaic law. 
But this manager, he gets benefit out of it. And he's just doing his job. I mean, he's probably not like an evil person. You know, he's got to eat too, right? So he's just, he's just going along to get along. But, but somehow maybe he kind of got off the track here and he's about to be fired. And so he goes to these, his debtors that the rich man has and, and he forgives a whole bunch of their debt. Just like you owe 100, make it 50. You owe 100, make it 80. I don't know why it's not always the same. But at any rate, he goes around and he, he undermines his boss by forgiving all this debt. And Jesus is trying to tell us something about how we are called to live when we find ourselves mired in these systemic sins that are, are just kind of part of the world in which we live in. That they are beyond our individual ability to change. And so, so how do we, as followers of Jesus, live in a world that is beset by these kinds of evils. And what the example that's given here, although it, the, the manager is, you know, acting a little selfishly, but he's also undermining the system, right? He, he's, he, in a way, he's sort of a, doing civil disobedience, right? That he's, he's finding a way to subvert the system, and in doing so, he's, he's hoping to reap benefit. But the same thing happens to us, right? Because if, if we can subvert some of these systems that, that systematically deny opportunity to others and deny us the gifts that they have to offer, we all benefit. That we would be more advanced and better off if, if the genius that arises in every generation and is able to flourish no matter where it comes from or in whom it resides. And so Jesus tells us that it's not enough to just go along to get along. That it's not enough to, to just be nice and, and keep our heads down. That's not what we're called to. We're called to, like the servant, to find ways to undermine the systems of oppression, to be, to be allies to the marginalized and the oppressed, to lift up those who have been pushed down. And not just in our individual lives, but in our collective lives as well. Because if we are ever to work with Jesus in building the kingdom of God, we must first make room for it and clear away the kingdom of sin in which we live now. Amen.